Greetings, Israel. This is a presentation that should really be a treat to my subscribers out there and listeners worldwide, as well as for Israel in general. Those of you who know me know that my position on our Hebrew women is one of love and uh, foremost respect. I believe that in order for our nation to continue to build and grow, our women must be respected and appreciated. Furthermore, when in relation to our nation in these last days, we should really be practicing unity. Not unity in false doctrine, but unity in one master, one belief, and one immersion. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. And this installment is really being generated and disseminated because we do have a beautiful nation and it is always important for us as a people to uplift our nation okay and it is my sincerest pleasure to welcome deborah to the broadcast she is a beautiful sister her and her isha produce short film where he's dedicated towards teaching about the most high she has a successful channel on youtube in which she talks about the plight and perils of our people and how we can change for the better and the channel link will be provided below and as always for those of you who have visited my youtube channel you know that i strongly emphasize commerce which naturally correlates with economics and today this beautiful sister is going to be talking about all things israel or many things israel and we're going to have a dialogue and a discussion about many things so stay tuned and tune in and don't go anywhere because this is definitely going to be a powerful interview uh, Deborah and her isha also run a supplemental educational program for parents who really want to homeschool their children in which they have developed essentially their own curriculum in order to assist parents who wish to educate their children at home and outside of the jurisdiction and confines of the matrix. So if you are interested in that, if you happen to be a single parent, then uh, I would strongly advise you to contact her uh, in order to find some more, find out some more information regarding the topics of homeschooling and private education. And there's just so much to be said that I can go on and on and on and on in this introduction for hours. So, without further ado, please welcome Deborah Yad to the show. Shalom, brothers and sisters. I'm glad to be here today. Thanks for the invite, young man. And um, I look forward to um, whatever questions you have for me in um, uplifting our people. And I just want to say I love you to every last one of you. And um, I look forward to seeing all of you on the other side. But until then, uh, let's deal with now, and that's that's why I'm here on the show today to um, to be interviewed by this um, this blessed young man. Hallelujah, and I am. Let me introduce myself. I am Shem Yuya Ben Israel, founder of Israelite Way of Life, non incorporated, non five hundred one c three. I was also a talk show host for the series Returning to the Father, but today it's not about me. Okay, it's not about me. It's about the body. Okay, it's about edification and uplifting of the body. And Israel, Israel I am tremendously excited uh, to welcome Deborah Yad to the broadcast. So as we endeavor to bring our nation together in truth and understanding regarding the set-apart ways of the Most High, let's really get into it, okay? All right, now. Okay. your search when the scripture says it says in all thy getting get understanding and it says search the scriptures so do your research search the scriptures and i guarantee you you're going to find the truth if you're truly seeking the truth and you'll find that christianity had nothing to do with anything dealing with the most high that this is a new doctrine it's a cult it's satanic and it's, it's something that's being used to turn our people away from the most high now, right now, we are in darkness, but we are waking up. 
And part of the waking up is the coming out of her. Coming out of who? Coming out of this wicked system of Christianity. Coming out of this wicked system of Babylon. And uh, Christianity is a huge part of that. And so we need to break away from that. Um, don't reject knowledge. Just do your research. Search the scriptures. Get in the word. Get on your knees and pray. A lot of people that are in Christianity, I heard one woman say that she hadn't read her Bible in 20 years, that she would just go and sit there and listen to her pastor talk. And so how can you have a relationship with the Most High if you ain't even studying? You ain't, you're not even praying. But everything that you have is through your pastor. That makes no sense whatsoever. You have no relationship with the Most High. You have a relationship with your pastor, with your religion, and with Christianity. Absolutely, absolutely. And when you look at the origin of many of your denominations, when you trace it back, it goes back to the Protestants and the protesters of the day. Mm -hmm. And the protesters were essentially those ones that were just protesting the infallibility of the Pope. So they, they were the ones who just said, okay, well, we're protesting the infallibility of the Pope, so we're coming from under the Catholic Church, quote unquote, and then they've, they've started their own thing, but they are still under that mm -hmm. umbrella of Christianity because at the core, it mm -hmm. started, their origin was within the Catholic Church and their doctrine was within mm -hmm. the Catholic Church. So it's only natural that even though they call themselves, quote unquote, protesting, that they are still going to adhere to the doctrines and tenets with a little exception of the Catholic Church. And this has been perpetuated a on throughout brand. the line. Yes, yeah, just a different brand, a different flavor of the same ice cream. You know, so excellent, exp excellent okay. exposition on that. And this really takes us into the topic of racism. Because, you know, with when you have the perpetuation of a form of religion placed upon a group of people in order to keep them uh, passive, in order to keep them obedient and to keep them away from the true knowledge of the way, what is true and correct. You have the why. Why is this being done? Why is this being committed? Why is this being perpetuated? Okay, why was this placed upon our people? So, you know, we know that it was placed upon our people by another group of people okay so can you go into uh, your perspective on racism and how it affects us and our people economically if you will well racism is one of the topics that i cover quite often and there's a reason for that a lot of our people don't realize that um our plight here in America, and I would venture to say all over this planet, is is largely due to racism. And uh, racism, the way it's been described by many, is, is not, you know, being described properly. Racism is a system. It's not a person calling you out of your name or, you know, that can be a part of it. Okay, but racism in and of itself is a system that's used to hold another group down. So based on that, I always tell people that black people don't have the power to be racist, okay? We can't be racist because we don't have anything to hold anyone back from, okay? The system is being used against us. We are in no position of power to where we can hold back another race, okay? Um, the, the biggest and strongest um, violations or uh, people that are racist against other groups is the Europeans, okay? It is them that brought us here in slavery, forced their God on us, and enforcing their God on us, you know, they actually used a good deal of our scripture, okay, and they put their own flavor to it. Um, they started with changing the names. If you look at all of the names in the Bible in the King James Version, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul. All of these names are European names, okay? But when you look at the real names, 
John, Yakana, Paul, Shaul, Jacob, Yaakov. Okay, when you look at these names, okay, they are the, the actual names. And then, like, um, uh, they, they call him Jesus, but his name was Yahshua. Okay, they took all of that out and gave us their names and their images because they knew and understood that in order to conquer the world, they would have to use Christianity. They would have to take something real and add some leaven to it. And because they added that leaven to it, they've leavened the whole lump. Okay, they've given the whole world an, adop uh, an adulterated version of the truth. Okay, meaning they mixed and mingled all kinds of garbage in there, and so you no longer have the original thing. When you open up the scripture, you see all kinds of things that are just, you know, uh, misconstrued because they've been misinterpreted. Okay, uh, one, one, one thing you have to understand, when you change one word, you can change the whole meaning of something. There was one passage um, that this Jewish guy was talking about, okay? He was saying that there was a passage where um, Yahshua was saying, um, he was talking to the Pharisees, and he says, do what they say. But the word was actually he, and he was referencing Moses. Do as he says, he. But they mistranslated that scripture and put they, so that would mean do what they, the Pharisees, are telling you to do. Okay, why would Yahshua tell us to do what the Pharisees said to do when he later on said, you are of your father the devil? But he wants us to do what they say do? No. So when you take scripture and you mistranslate it into um, something that's going to fit your agenda, then you have added leaven to the word of the Most High. And so, therefore, we, we have to ask the Most High to purge out the leaven of the Pharisees, to take these things that have been added to his, his scriptures and give us the true meaning of what these words are. So what they've done with mixing Christianity with um, our Hebraic roots they have given us an adulterated version, which is in favor of them. One good example I like to use is um, the scripture that describes Solomon. My beloved is white and ruddy. Now, a lot of them say, see, Solomon was white. Solomon was not white. When you look up the word used for, that they used white for, I believe it's tasak. Okay, and the word actually means illuminated or bright or um, glowing. In other words, his appearance was glowing or illuminated. That does not mean white, okay? But when you use that and you say, see, right here, you show a person that one scripture, then you'll have a bunch of Israelites saying, uh, they do have a point there. It does say he was white. But they will look past all of the other scripture that tells you the children of Israel were black. Their visage or their face was black. Visage means face. It says blacker than cold. There is absolutely nothing you can do to a white or pale skinned person to make their flesh black. Okay. That being said, with all of this misinterpreting of scripture, um, which was largely due to racism, um, you have our people now sitting in darkness not knowing what to believe, because this is all they know. When you turn on the television, you turn on the movies, and you look at a movie about Moses, you see Charlton Heston, and because that is etched into our minds as a people, you ask um, a black person, what did Moses look like? Um, he probably looked kind of like Charlton Heston. We say it referencing a movie. I asked one of my students what she believed Adam and Eve, and her answer was, where we left off was you were talking about the, the labeling and the, the student who, yes, yes, absolutely, you were, you were going into the fact that, you know, our people and scripture, the recorded book of our people, and how it's, really been whitewashed it's really been whitewashed and we know that yes. we know that mm -hmm. you know 
there was there was thousands of years in which spe specifically in reference to the Catholic Church that the people, the laymen, couldn't read the scriptures. It was the Catholic Church and the priests that used to interpret the scripture for the people mm -hmm. and that the people weren't even permitted to read the scriptures because back then and as it is now, the scriptures were used as a method, as an instrument of control to control the masses. Okay, this is what Jesus said. You do what Jesus says, and Jesus says this, and that since Jesus says this, mm -hmm. you can't do that, you know, and it really gave them a power base, and it created this power structure that there, were, there, was, an, there was a hierarchy, and the priest was the mm -hmm. the patriarch and then everyone else was just the the lame and the followers and the ones that were being force fed these doctrines and brainwashed and manipulated and you know with our people when you look at these translations because there's so many different translations we have to be cognizant of what we are reading because Many times, and so often, people say, well, just, you know, go and just read the Bible, okay? Just go and read the Bible, but what Bible are you reading? You know, do you have the understanding to decipher the paganism that's in that Bible in order to really gain the truth? And basically, what you were saying was extremely deep. It was extremely deep, and hallelujah that our people are starting to wake up and starting to come to the realization that, hey, you know, we have to start taking our history back. We have to start taking our manuscripts back because they were ours from the get go. Now, what also I really wanted to address is the William Lynch doctrine. And if you could really go into okay. William Lynch and specifically in how William Lynch provided a blueprint of how Hebrew men and Hebrew women treat one another. And especially that piece of the William Lynch letter and just specifically uh, going over how that's been successful in our current day and age in relation to how us as Hebrew men treat our women and how our women look and view us, if you will. Okay. Um, I'd like to talk about the Willie Lynch letter because um, I think it's very important. Um, I think last year sometime I posted it in one of my homeschool groups and I asked parents um, at what age do they feel their children should be allowed to read the Willie Lynch letter. Um, we prepared a whole lesson, a whole um, study on the, the Willie Lynch letter to present to our students because I felt that this is something they need to understand and they, they need to know that this document is out there. You know, even for those who try to say, oh, I don't believe that that document is authentic, um, I see it in the black community very heavily. So I believe that it is and that this was something of a tool that was used um, by our former slave masters to control us. Uh, the document talks about the divide between the man and the woman. Uh, the skin color, the light versus the dark. Um, it talked about how the man was going to be stripped of his power and authority and that they were going to try to shift it to the woman and, you know, doing all of these sorts of things. And what did they use to bring out, bring these things about? They used brutality. You know, um, one part of the document talks about how they would um, tie one leg to this horse and another to that horse and hit the horse. Okay, if you don't behave, Negro, of course, that's not what they called us. They called us something else. If you don't behave, this is what's going to happen to you. And when you look at um, how they put the woman above the man, that was done through belittling the man. Okay, the slave master would make that brother look so bad, would make him look so low to where his woman had to look down like this. She couldn't look him in the eye and feel any type of 
um, safety or security in that man because he was stripped of his power and his authority in that in that marriage or in that family structure by, in many cases, a white male who was a lot smaller or weaker. Even if our, our men were bigger and stronger and more masculine, he was stripped down to nothing when he was whipped, beat, verbally abused, um, castrated sometimes. I mean, the, the most horrific things were done to our men in the face of our women so that the woman would no longer have respect or feel any type of security in that man. And so when you look at the Willie Lynch letter, I mean, there is so many elements to it. But in dealing with the, um, the male and female version of it, um, we as a people have lost respect for each other. And, you know, even though, you know, we had at some, after so-called slavery was abolished, in which I never, be, I don't believe it was abolished, um, it seemed like we were starting to gain a little more respect for each other as males and females or married couples. But there was something that had happened back in the 60s. This, I believe the feminism movement is something that happened to where, you know, black women started trying to get more um, authority and more, um, more say-so in things. And not only that, the government also said we will use the welfare system to break these families apart, too. So they, they have this law where if you were a woman, your man cannot live in the same house with you and you get benefits. He has to be gone. And so a lot of women said, okay, bye-bye, you have to go because me and my kids need some money from the government. And since you can't get a job, then you have to go. Okay, why would they do such a thing? This was put in place because they know that our strength is in a family unit. And so these wicked people said that we have to break these families apart. And so we're going to prevent him from getting a job. He's not going to get a job because we're not going to hire him. And if we do hire him, it's going to be for the lowest job that we can give him where he won't have enough to take care of his family. So she's going to see seek to supplement the income by getting on government aid. So there was a whole system. I mean, when you think about the matrix, this is it for us. The matrix, the matrix is this whole system that has been put in place for our total destruction and annihilation. And it all started with that Willie Lynch letter. Divide and conquer is what you see happening with a black man and the black woman. Now these saints that try to divide us, they are also the ones funding the hip hop generation. They will fund a song where a black man is degrading a black woman to the lowest of the low calling her out of her name, calling her this, calling her that. And the black woman, because she wants to earn money, she gets in this video and she twerks her behind in the video for the money. Now, I talked with a friend of mine. She saw an interview where a lot of the young ladies in the videos are actually college students. They're not even that way when they come out from behind the camera. <laughs> but they say, I'm doing this for the money so that I can pay for my education. Mm. But when little Laquita or Shaquanda sees this video, she's trying to be like what she sees portrayed in the video. And she's taking it to the max, okay? She's taking it to the max. She's not off going to college, though, but she's twerking her behind. And then the young men see this, and they hear the words, and you all know what the words are. You, you all know what they're calling our young women. And our young women are dancing to the very song that degrades them. And so you just have this moral decline going on. They're not looking for wives. Now, when this young lady gets pregnant, the young man is saying to himself that you're nothing but this or you're nothing but that. I don't want a future with you. And so the young girl is left crying, weeping, moaning, groaning, sad, broken, and beaten down. And then she goes on to the next young man, and he does the same thing. And it's all perpetuated by this music that our oppressors like to make sure gets the, the proper funding. When you listen to the music 
um, from the 60s and 70s. Uh, you, you're hearing stuff like endless love, people talking about marriage, people talking about, oh, you're so beautiful to me and you're this they, they said you know what our press has said enough of that music i don't need this black yeah, man yeah. singing this love song to this black woman some kind of way we got to change this thing around because if they keep singing like that to each other they're going to have these solid foundational marriages they're going to keep on loving each other so we need somebody who's going to sing a song where the black man hates the black woman where he's degrading her where he's putting her down but the one thing our oppressors will not do, you would be hard pressed to find a song where a white man is talking about how no good, how trampish and how horish a white woman is. You won't find such a song. You will not find a song where an Asian man is talking about how chinky the, the Chinese women are and how this they are and they, they're just the lowest of the low. You won't find a song where a Mexican guy is putting down Mexican women or an Arab song where an Arab is putting down Arab women. You all get the right. picture. But black people, we are so foolish. We are so foolish that we put ourselves out there like that. And black men don't get it. We just don't get it. Absolutely, absolutely. And you mentioned the 60s. And what's interesting to note is that during the 60s, we were proactive. And our people, in a large part, were proactive. And because we were proactive, we were able to stand on the strength of our nation and get things accomplished. However, when you look at how you know it transitioned into the 80s and into the 90s and, and up until where we are now, we went from that proactive nature of the 60s in the revolutions to being reactive and reactionary. Because when you look at even the origin of hip hop, it was reactionary. NWA, they were reacting to the police brutality of the 80s in Los Angeles and these things. We were reacting and even on the East Coast, when you look at Grandmaster Flash and Run DMC, you know, they were reacting to what was happening in their community. What we need to do as a people is to go back to not to the 80s, not to the 90s, but go back to the a spirit of the 60s in which we were of a more proactive nature and use that proact proactive nature to really uh, uh, get the ball moving forward instead of just waiting for something to happen. And then when something does happen, we either pick it or, you know, we as people, we appeal to Jesse Jackson or, or these Al Sharptons out there that, you know, are that we put up on a pedestal to stand up for us when things happen to us we we need to start being proactive and start standing up and saying enough is enough and this needs to happen with our people we we need to stop and it's interesting because you also mentioned subsidies and people taking subsidies you know we need to stand up and say well we as a nation need to be more self-sufficient. We as a nation need to be more independent. And part of which is business and us creating our own businesses and our own, not only that, but being able to make those businesses thrive. So can you go into that sector and, and speak on our people and if they want to start a business if they want to start their own business and really come out of the system and do that can you can you give them some advice on how they can start their own business or what avenues they can go into for them to really go down that area and and, and make that step and make that transition from that to starting their own business okay one thing I would like to say, I want to backpedal a little bit about the 60s, and then I'll go right into it. This is actually perfect. Um, one thing we used to do back in the 60s is we used to boycott. Okay, we don't do that now. We won't take a stand against a company and boycott. If we would learn to do that, then we would put ourselves in that frame of mind of being able to start a business to fulfill the need of the company that we're boycotting. 
You know, I remember years ago, someone told me this. They said, you know what? Black people love to wear leather coats. We love to wear leather jackets, leather caps, leather this, leather that. But we don't own no leather factories. Okay? And, you know, it, it, a lot of things that we like to do. We just, we, we really, as a people, we have adopted this, um, this um, attitude of conforming to this world versus separating ourselves from this world or from this, this culture that we've um, been thrust into. We don't know how to boycott anymore. And I think if we learn how to do that, we'll, we'll find ourselves figuring things out on the business end. My husband and I have been in business um, since we've been together pretty much. Um, I started my very first business when I was 12 years old, okay? I'm an artist. And so I said, you know what, I like to draw, I like to paint. I went, I, I was a shy kid, but when it came to business, it was, it was something that came alive in me. I would go knock on a stranger's door, and I would take a picture that I had painted or drawn, and I would say, hey, um, if you got kids, I can do their picture. I can do your picture. I can do your dog, whatever. And I got a lot of people who said no, but then I got those who said yes. And so I said, okay, well, let's make this happen. At the time, I was only charging $10 for my pictures, but that was a you know, long time ago. And as I grew, you know, I kept that same attitude of uh, being in business for myself. That is one of the things that we teach our children. You know, my children can't think back to a time to where we weren't talking to them about business. And I think it's very important that we as a people learn this, but in order to get this attitude of business in our minds and in our heads and in our very souls, we have to learn how to boycott this stuff out here. Okay, if I'm not going to um, eat Monsanto corn anymore, where am I going to get my corn from? If you got a backyard, if you got some land, you grow your own corn, okay? Um, a lot of us have gotten really dependent on the system and everything. And so until we get rid of that dependent attitude, we are always going to be knocking on um, Massa's door for a handout. Massa, I need water. Massa, I need food. I need this. I need education. Can you teach me, Massa? I mean, we're always going to do that until we uh, learn how to be like we used to be. Our people used to be self-sufficient. We weren't always like this, but we have allowed everything in this culture to make us this way. And when you try to break that, break that uh, mold that we put ourselves into, it, we don't want to break it. You say something to a person about growing their own food, selling their own food, um, starting their own business, nobody wants to put forth the effort to do so. And so what is going to happen then? when there is no job to be had. We already see this happening across this nation where the middle class is being thrust into the lower class because they're not going up. They're not going into the higher class because even the higher class people are losing their ground. The ground is very shaky. And so the only people that are going to be looking good in the, in the near future are those who can establish some type of self-sufficiency. That's in, in um, business, that's in your own, growing your own food, whatever it is you have to do. Now, to be more specific about business, a lot of us have a lot of wonderful ideas, and we have no idea how to get started, okay? And uh, the mistake that a lot of people make is trying to go into business and spending the most that they can up front. And that is a huge no-no. I can do a whole segment on business alone. And as a matter of fact, um, that is something that I intended on doing, <laughs> one who does know. And the one thing we need to do is listen. If someone is giving you something to do, listen. Um, one, one very important tip I like to give to everybody is if you have a business that is um, that can appeal to the masses, and I don't mean just Hebrews. If you have a product or a service that can appeal to the masses, you can't say I'm a black business. You just can't do that. And um, a lot of people don't understand that, but if you uh, put yourself out there as a black business sometimes, uh, that can be um, 
that can be a hindrance to your profits. Okay. Now, on the other hand, if your market is black people, then scream it on the mountaintops. If that's your market, go after that market. But if you are selling um, salt shakers, don't say this is my black-owned salt shaker. You give it a generic name, okay, and you sell that to the masses because there are some people who will not patronize you because you are black. Ask me how I know. <laughs> how do you know? <laughs> Ask me how I know. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know because um, the the business that my husband is in is a, a gen, we is a generic business, but we have some customers who insist on talking to us first. Okay, and when they do that, one customer in particular, um, he he spoke with my husband, and my husband um, don't really know how to change his voice, if you know what I mean. So he sounds like a black man. <laughs> And this customer, right away, he was so excited through email. Um, oh, I'm so excited about this project and blah, 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 this and blah, blah, that. Um, he does commercials for businesses. And this customer, when, when he talked to my husband, everything dried up. He wouldn't respond to emails anymore. The excitement was gone. And he just it seemed like he dropped off the face of the earth because he found out he was dealing with a black business. Okay. And so we have my husband's video business as it relates to commercials or um, ads or video ads like that is generic. We don't promote ourselves as a black owned business. Now we do have a black version of it, but it's the same business. And so that, that's one thing when, when you're in business, you have to be wise. Okay. So if you have a product, like even some of our um, curriculum, um, our home, um, school curriculum. We have those that have the black images on them, and then we have those with generic images. And we sell the generic version to the generic market. And we sell the black version to the black market. The black market sounds so so strange, but you know what I'm trying <laughs> to say here. To people of color. <laughs> Absolutely. To people of color. Absolutely. Well, once again, we are being joined by the lovely, as always, Deborah Yah from Black Education TV on YouTube and be sure to check out her YouTube channel and it's going to be down below. And once again, I mean, we're on a roll here and we're talking about many things Israel. We're talking about many things Israel and what you said reminded me of, you remember the show Martin, right, with Martin Lawrence that was on years back? Yes. Well, there was an episode where yes. he was he needed the, he needed the police, so he called nine one one, and they wouldn't come unless he proved he was a white man. So he was going through all these different. <laughs> they were asking him all these different questions to prove that he was a white man. You know, like what type of food he ate, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> what music he listened to, and it just really <laughs> it just really paints the picture that. You know, it is a reality. The the economic bias towards our people is strong and it is heavy because when you look at, you know, events recorded in history like Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in which our people were uh, supporting one another and supporting our businesses, we not only thrived, but we thrived to such an extent that we were just embarrassing the rest of the population. And they know that they know what we're capable of. And they refuse to really acknowledge us and give us a level playing field. And I'm not I'm not just I'm not saying that to just shift the blame, the liability, you know, many things are our are, are fault too. I'm not just trying to play the victim in this yeah. instant and, and blaming everything on someone else. But what I am saying is that right. there is a system in place that not only thrives, but profits tremendously off our people. But when our people are in positions uh, of, of business ownership, um, you know, we we seldom have to work twice as hard to reap the same rewards. So what I would really like to, and I would really like to uh, sum this entire interview up in that 
even though we are we find ourselves in a state of at times disparity but in, in a state of knowing that we have tremendous capabilities and capacities that when you look at sports figures when you look at people like LeBron James or you know these types of Kobe Bryant's you know when we have when there's a level playing field when when the rules are the same all across the board and when we can compete competitively on an equal playing field that we naturally excel we naturally excel and and deep down there is a there is a presence of evil that knows who we are they know we're the people of scripture and because of that they try to really keep us among the lower echelons of society because we all know that we don't own the ships bringing the the, the drugs into our communities we don't own the gunsmiths that are churning out millions upon millions of guns per year you know we don't own the distilleries that are brewing the alcohol and and, and owning the marijuana fields that are growing the marijuana and so on and so forth but when you look at what's right. perpetuated in the media we are the ones that are the is the problem we are the ones that can't get it right quote unquote so in these last mm -hmm. in these last uh, few minutes can you just uh, go through and go through and just give a quick summary of really which the the main points that you would like to for our young people to really get from this interview okay for our young people i i really want them to see the benefits of cohesion i want them to understand what it means to work together what it means to act together because uh, there you know there's a saying there is strength in numbers you know um, if we work together as a people and stop working um, apart from another or stop trying to hinder one another and get rid of that crabs in a barrel mentality we can see so many blessings unfold right before us whenever when I see other groups um, they all come together and they know how to make things happen they know how to put differences aside uh, there's one story in particular I remember um, we we read this years ago when we first got on eBay um, they were talking about a group of employ employees from this one company I think it was 1,000 of them they said hey let's start our own eBay empire and they began to sell they came together they put um, X amount of dollars in together each and every one of them and they bought all of this merchandise and they began to sell it on eBay one billion dollars because they came together to make this happen now when you try to relay that to black people or you know I don't really like to call us black people but for the sake of this conversation for those who don't understand our culture I'm gonna say black people when you try to you know give that testimony to black people we say and we leave it right there we don't understand that working together in everything we do we can accomplish so much in business spiritually even spiritually we are so divided you have this doctrine over here that doctrine over there everything we do is it's like a it's a mess a big ball of mess no cohesion whatsoever so therefore we can't get anything accomplished in our homes we're divided in our um, communities we're divide, divided in our businesses we're divided because you have black people who won't support black businesses you know I read one story where there was a um, older lady who owned a gas station and they were saying that they were trying to fight to help her keep her gas station afloat because of the competition around her um, that she wasn't getting a lot of the business in a black community because we have our brothers and sisters saying that mr. Charlie his gas is better and so therefore I'm not gonna buy from Miss Wilma I'm gonna buy from mr. Charlie because his stuff is better and his stuff is no different than hers they got the same price on the sticker but we won't take that effort to just cross the street and support our sister we come up with all kinds of excuses 
And so until we learn cohesion, you can expect this thing to repeat itself generation after generation. If you can't learn how to work together with your own people, you can forget it. You can just hang it up. Because there will be no growth in Israel if Israel cannot come together. And that's the one thing you, we need to put in our young people at a very early age. It's not about disliking other people or hating other people. That has nothing to do with it. It's about loving yourself, loving each other. We are our brother's keepers, whether we want to believe it or not. And we are the main problem. I say we're the main problem because we see everybody else and what they're doing to us. But instead of us trying to fix what we're doing to each other, we're concentrating a whole lot on what Massa's doing, but we're not concentrating on what we're doing that's hurting our own people. So um, I really enjoyed the interview, and I look forward to more. There's so much to talk about, so many things, um, and I know we only have a limited amount of time on the interviews, but I really appreciate you inviting me to your show here, and I hope that our young people can walk away with something, even if it's just one itty-bitty thing. Walk away with something that you can chew on, that you can meditate on and take into your spirit and say, I've got to make a change in me. Absolutely, absolutely. Very well said. Well, that concludes uh, this interview. Uh, I am joined with my guest, Deborah Ya from Black Education TV. You can also visit her YouTube channel, which is going to be provided down below. I am Shin Yuya Ben Israel from IsraeliteWayOfLife.org. And we thank you all for tuning in to this installment. And Yah willing, many things that were discussed hit home and is going to inspire you to take proactive measures in your household and as well as in our community. So once again, I would like to thank Deborah Yah and her family for the interview. And once again, I am Shimi Thank you for having me. Ben Israel, you're welcome. Shalom. Sh Shalom.